Then I'll be preaching my message from Thursday. But we do good to get young people to come to church today. But part of the reason is because they have not been exposed to the real God that we say we serve. I know somebody. We say God is powerful, but we don't act like God is powerful. We say God is great, but we don't act like God is great. God has given us an order saying these signs shall follow them that believe in his name will cast out devils, lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. But strangely enough, we're not seeing sick folk get recovered. We're not seeing demons cast out. And I'm not talking about from the pulpit. I'm talking about from the pew. It was never intended that the power would just rest in the pulpit. It was intended that the power would be transferred from the pulpit to the pews. That's what the book of Ephesians says when he gave the fivefold ministry for the perfecting of the saints for the working of ministry. But something has gotten a little off. And so I find myself today, even as I prepared and prayed about what I was supposed to say for Father's Day, my question to the fathers, and this would be my actual sermon to the brothers, what will you leave behind? What will you leave behind? Mm. I'm struggling because when I look at where we are today, I find in our text this man by the name of David. And David is on his way to his deathbed. He is on his way to die. And the Bible said David acknowledged that he was about to die. He says, I'm about to go the way of the earth. He knows that he's going to die. Doesn't matter how great David has been, there was coming a day where David had to die. Come on, come on. Come on, come on now. The question I have today, ladies and gentlemen, is not what you're going to do at your death, but how will you live prior to your death? Come on, come on. What will you have to leave behind? Can I preach like I feel it today, y'all? Come on, come on, come on. What? When you leave here. Uh -huh. One of the things we find about David, he's giving this closing address, and, and actually the two texts tie together when he starts talking about these things and his death, and he's actually making a pronouncement to the people that he's about to go, and he's telling them who is supposed to be king. Because one of his sons, his fourth son, decided that when he, because David was about to die, he was going to take charge and he was going to run things. Oh, you got to understand who you are and what your place is. Men, one of the first things that God has ordained for us to release is purpose concerning those that are under us. Can I, can I, can I talk right there? Because when I was thinking about yesterday, because so we have been socialized, and I thank God for being in kingdom life today, and for the way the ladies celebrated the men today, the fathers today, because most of the time, that's not the case. Now think about how much fanfare Mother's Day gets. Am I talking good? Oh yeah, they have, they have brunches, they have all this other stuff. They make sure they got whole sections for to buy stuff for mama. But when Father's Day comes, they tell you to go buy him a grill and get daddy out on the grill and get him cooking on Father's Day. On Father's Day, y'all want to be treated like a queen. Treat me out. Treat me wonderful. I'm a queen. Well, what queen have you ever met that doesn't have a King somewhere. I'm just, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. At some point, we need to learn to honor the men in the places that we are. Oh, I know what the problem is because society has trained us to minimize the role of men in the family. Y'all gonna help me preach it here today? They trained us to minimize the roles of men. Now I have a problem with the women. 
women running around here talking about, those single women talking about, I'm the father and the mother. No, uh -huh. baby, unless you got some kind of genetic problem going on, you are not the father and the mother. You may be a doggone good mother, but you are not a father. You can never be a father because God didn't build you that way. Maybe, oh, can I push like I feel it? Maybe one of the reasons why you still single is because you got too much man in you. Oh, you so busy. And even when you didn't jump the gun and you did get the one that God ordained, 
day for your life. He's not perfect. Neither are you. Well, since he's not perfect, that the same grace you need for when you mess up, when you miss the mark, why did you struggle to extend the same grace to the man? Come on, come on. Amen. Brothers, brothers, do me a favor. Look around and say, ladies, we need grace too. We need grace too. Right. <laughs> and I'm so serious. We really do need grace. And it's amazing how things are so off balance. You mess up, you do some crazy stuff. And the thing is, somehow what happens is we tend to try and weigh out our sins. Can I preach today, y'all? We make the mistake of trying to weigh out our sins. Even when it comes to our brothers and our sisters, we try to weigh out our sins. We try to make it look like ours is better than theirs. And what we did wasn't so bad. Well, listen, ladies and gentlemen, you might want to consider something. If you did it, if you messed up, it was still just as wrong as what they did. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on. This is going to help everybody. I hope everybody's grabbing this. We can't sit here and look at anybody else and judge anybody else on where they are in life. If That's they right. messed up, you can't sit here and look at how bad they are. No, you messed up too. You might think yours wasn't as bad, but when you really add it all up, sin still sinks. Sin still stinks. All unrighteousness is So, it is necessary that we find out what is needed for the transition. What will you leave behind? This question is not just valid for men. It is also valid for every woman sitting in this room. What will you leave behind? Can I, can I put it on a more personal level? If you're on a job today, and let's say down the road, you don't even know when it may come, but five years, ten years down the road, they may write you a pink slip and say it's time for you to go. What will you leave? Yes, sir. When you went to the family reunion, you know all your cousins ain't all got it together. Every one of us in here got some crazy cousins and some drunk uncles. <laughs> we got some crazy cousins and some drunk uncles and some aunties that like to smoke. I didn't say smoke. I didn't say smoke. I said See, we all have some, but now the question is, did you go to the family reunion and act a fool and say, oh, he knows he shouldn't be like that. He knows he shouldn't be, oh, he knows he needs to let those drugs go. Or what did you leave behind? All right. Everywhere you go, saints of God, that should be a question that resonates in your head. I don't I don't care if you just went to the grocery store and you talk, and you talk to the clerk that rung up your groceries. The question of the day is what did you leave behind? Yes, yes. So around third base, I'm moved on the story of David. At the close of his life, He's having a conversation with the people that he has led. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting because David, the inference here is that David was not hiding anything from his son. One of the things we got to learn how to do is be honest about our lives. Sometimes our children will avoid some of the mistakes that we've made when we can simply be honest with the choices that we have made. Yeah. Come on, come on. Uh, every day in David's life wasn't beautiful. Can I get a talk back, church, right there? There were days when David messed up. And I'm not even talking about Bathsheba, ladies and gentlemen. 
There were days when David had to run across the countryside because Saul was trying to kill him. There were days when David had the opportunity to kill leadership. Oh, I'm talking up in the house right now. There were days when David had the opportunity to kill leadership, but he said, I won't touch him because that's God's anointing. Whether you like it or not, if they're in leadership, they're God's anointing. You might want to take your hands off, leave them alone, hush your mouth, and leave them to God. David had the opportunity, but David didn't kill him. David had a son who tried to usurp his authority, and David had to deal with that. There were things that happened in David's life that hurt you. Ladies and gentlemen, there will be some things that come in your life that hurt you. But one thing you can't afford to do is let the pain of your past predict your future. Y'all not going to help me preach up in here. You can't afford to let the pain of your past predict your future. Yes, Saul chased him. Yes, he had to play crazy to get out of a city. Yes, he had to live in a place where he didn't want to live. Y'all do remember when the sick lad got burned down? That was a place David really did not want to be because it was actually in the Philistine camp. In other words, David was sleeping with the enemy. He was in the enemy's camp. And ladies and gentlemen, he really didn't want to be there. And then can I top it off by telling you there came a day when David was invited by the king of Gath to go to war with all the Philistines against Israel. He was invited because he was connected to the king of Gath, King Akish. And King Akish said, come on, you got to go to war with us. I know you and your 600 men. Y'all are some bad boys. You got to go to war with us. And he goes out and he's ready for battle. And the other kings of the Philistines see David in the battle and say, hold up. Do you, Akish, do you know who you got in your ranks with you? And Akish said, yeah, that's David. He's been loyal to me. He's been cool. He said, oh, they said, no, 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 no. Don't let him in. Don't let him fight. Now, here's what I want you to see. David even had to deal with some decisions that did not, that were not comfortable for him. Have any of you ever been in a position where you had decisions to make that it was either bad on this side or bad on the other? See what I'm saying? Because him and his 600 men, they could have decided to fight, and then they would have been fighting against God's people. They would have got themselves in trouble with God. Or they could have fought from behind enemy lines and lost their place to live. What do you do if you got to make that kind of decision? Thankfully, God's grace was there that when the other king said, no, we don't want David fighting, that's when they sent David. When king, he said, David, I'm sorry. You can't fight with us. you got to go back home. Sometimes God, don't you thank God for being God and helping with some decisions you've got to make when you don't know what to do? He, 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 he went on home and got all the stories. Sick lad got burned. He went to go, went to go get his stuff. Sometimes, brothers, you can't sit back and let the enemy keep running over your stuff. I'm preaching right there. Sometimes, ladies, you can't sit back and let the enemy keep running over your stuff. The Bible said that David, when they, when they saw that their city was burned, Sick lad was burned, that his men spoke of stoning him. But, ladies and gentlemen, in spite of the danger of being stoned,
David encouraged himself. I don't have time to go through the entire history of David's life. But David had some ups and he had some downs. I'm preaching to somebody up in here. Brothers, you will have some ups and some downs. And the, 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 our, our behavior, the tendency that's built into us is when we start getting discouraged, we shut down. I can't hear my brothers holler back at me. I said, when we start going through and when we get disappointed, we shut down. We don't talk about it. We don't want to be bothered. And our famous saying is, I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> Wife asks me, what's wrong? I'm good. Children say, Daddy, what's wrong? I'm good. What's wrong? Nothing. Now see, can I, can I work right here for a minute? Ladies, our nothing is different from your nothing. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Now, y'all say nothing, and sooner or later, y'all gonna come out with it, and y'all be like, <laughs> or either you go crying out, and then you come back, and y'all done with it. Our, but our nothing is different from your nothing. Because as men, we have been socialized that we don't cry. So we don't, so many times, can I preach right here? Many times we as men don't know how to communicate what we're really dealing with on the inside. So our nothing isn't really nothing. It means our pressure valve is about to build up. And you might want to move back because there's an explosion coming. Now, brothers, that does not give you an excuse to explode. I can hear nobody. That doesn't give us an excuse to explode, but what happens is many times because we don't know how to properly handle our pressure, we explode. Mm. It happens that the prayer, watch this, and brothers, we get it in two ways. So either we explode or we implode. Sometimes the pressure from the outside gets on the inside and then builds up so much we explode. But then there's other times that we implode and we do crazy stuff. Uh-oh. We make crazy decisions. We go back to the drugs that we were once on, the alcohol we once drank, the women we ran the once ran. That's the implosion because now the things from the outside are pressing in on you. Now the explosion is when we just flip out and get angry and act a fool and let it come out on whoever it comes out on. But the implosion is the crazy behaviors we exist. Am I helping somebody today? Hey. And, and don't think just because I'm talking to the brothers, ladies, y'all aren't prone to one of those too. Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. so yes. They, get, they get quiet on me when I start doing that. But, but, but that's the reality. It's more built into our nature, but it doesn't exclude y'all. Ladies, y'all do it too. Yes. See, let me let me let me show y'all a lightweight version of it happening. Ladies, when they start going through implosion moments, they start going to change their hair a whole bunch. Uh, <laughs> I am messing right now. Now I'm not saying it's wrong to change your hair and you know, you know, have different styles or whatever, that's fine. But when you're changing your hair every week, come on, come on. on. You make me wonder what's going on. You all right. Come on, come on. Y'all want to be preaching that way for the make it loud. But that's the reality. It is. Implosions. But the point I want to make is in life, we're going to deal with some ups and we're going to deal with some downs. And that's a part of your life. But you got to understand that it's what makes up who you are. As I prepare to close this, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to think about something. There's a word that is resonating in my spirit. A couple of words that are resonating in my spirit. One of those words is legacy. Legacy. Heritage. And then posterity. Yeah. Mm. I'm going to give you some, some nuggets behind that. Legacy is what you leave behind yeah, yeah. for the next generation, for those who are coming after you. Yeah. 
But the heritage, now a lot of times legacy has a lot more to do with our behaviors and the and the actions of who we are. But then the heritage is more, actually let me reverse that. Legacy deals more with the things, the stuff that we leave behind. But when we deal with heritage, it deals with the behaviors and the attributes that we leave behind. What are you leaving behind? And so God, is, let me just help somebody right here. There's a whole lot of people trying to be legends. Mm. God's not concerned with us being legends. Uh-uh. He's concerned with legacy. Every action we exhibit, ladies and gentlemen, we got to think about what we are leaving behind. Oh, and we tend to think that because nobody saw us, it's not affecting our legacy. That's right. Ladies and gentlemen, what you have to realize is this. Look at David and then look at Solomon. Now, in the text that we're looking at, we see where David left Solomon, and I'll get into that in a moment. But one of the other things that David left behind was a legacy or a heritage of a problem with women. Oh. Y'all not talking. Come on, come on. David was a great king, but he had a problem with women. To the point where, if you look in the chapters right before chapter 28, in, in Chronicles, you'll find where David was about to die. They said that his flesh had gotten cold and they, he, he, he couldn't warm himself up. You know, as people get old, they have difficulty getting warm. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as he was about to die, what they did was they found the most beautiful woman in the kingdom. Come on, come on. I'm preaching the book. You can see it for yourself. David has found the most beautiful woman woman in the kingdom said girl go in there and lay down next to David and we don't see if David really is about to die or not come on come on with me say those go girl and lay down next you you fine as all get a girl go lay down next to David we'll know whether he's about to die or not Let's see how he responds to the situation. <laughs> and when David did not respond to the situation, he said, oh, the light is going out. Come on, come on now. It'd be different if I wasn't preaching the book. I'm telling y'all what the book said. <laughs> but watch this, ladies and gentlemen. It's like your see, and so they, they determined that David was about to die by laying a woman next to him. And the downfall of Solomon was that Solomon had 800 wives. Yeah. How in the world? How? <laughs> How can you have 800? It's only 365 days in a year. Okay, I'm sorry. Let me, let me get out of this. So what I'm trying to say, ladies and gentlemen, we've got to realize is that we've got to understand that where David was, David, you've got to be careful of what you leave behind. You've got to be careful of the demons that you let ride in your life. Because sooner or later, those demons, if you don't take them out, if you don't handle them, if you don't address them, what you don't kill in this infancy will come back and haunt the future generation. You wonder why your daughter's starting to act fast. Maybe because you ain't dealt with that demon in you. Yeah, wow, wow, wow. Maybe because you haven't dealt with that demon that is familiar. We call them familiar spirits. They hang around in the family line. Maybe that's a part of the problem. You haven't dealt with those spirits. It's time, I don't know who I'm preaching to, but it's time for some of us in here to deal with our family demons and time to put the eviction notice on those demons and tell them you can't stay here any longer because my children will not carry on what I had, what my mama had, what my grandma, my children will not have that. So ladies and gentlemen, David says, Number one, he says, Solomon, God wouldn't let me build the house of worship, but he wants you to build it. Now, one thing I love about God is that God doesn't always choose the one who's supposed to be chosen. 
That's he right. He chose David the young That's child. That's right. Now y'all don't hear me. He chose David the young child to be the king. He didn't choose his older sons. He chose his young child. And he chose the one from Bathsheba, the one who David messed up with. Isn't it amazing that God can take a mess up and still raise up the situation and flip it around and make it work for good? Y'all do understand that Jesus came from that lineage, don't you? So if Solomon hadn't been in place, Good God, I got to go. So now he tells Solomon, you're going to build the temple. Fathers, one thing, how to be a man. Here's point number two. Now, how are you going to be a man, fathers? you got to lay a foundation of worship for your house. Y'all not talking. Brothers, you got to lay a foundation of worship for your house. If you're a single mama, sisters, married women, everybody, lay a foundation of worship for your house. Your children ought to see I hear you worship God. Your children ought to see. I'm not just talking about in church. I'm talking about outside the church. When you in the car, they ought to hear you worship him. When you're at the house, they ought to hear you worship him. When you're going to your job, they ought to, they ought to know that you love God for real. Come on now. Oh, Lord Jesus. And so you got to lay a foundation for worship. You got to show. Don't let your children sit down during praise and worship. You got to tell them, y'all stand up, because I need to teach you how to honor the God of our salvation. That's the reason why there arose a generation that did not know God, because they had people who did not deposit God in them. It's time for us to get back to the place where we start depositing God in our young people. We ought to create an environment where God can be glorified. Are y'all going to talk to me up in here? We ought to create an environment. We ought to set a stage for worship. David had a plan. Let me go a little further. If you read further down, I didn't read it in the text, but in Chronicles 28, he also told them, he said, not only did I lay a plan for the worship, but I also provided for the worship. Brothers, you got to be a provider. You got to work hard and teach it and use what you got to honor God with it in everything that you do. David loved God so much. He said, I'm going to take from the treasury to build the house. He said, but I'm going to go in my treasure in my own stash and add some more along with it. I come to talk to somebody in here today that says, I need to be a better giver because if I love God like I say I do, I have something in my heart ought to challenge me to want to give better, to show my love and my appreciation for God. I shouldn't lack on my tithing. Let me try that again. I spend the lack on my tithing. So for all y'all five dollar, ten dollar folk, that's all you give, and you don't honor God with it with, with the tithe. Ten percent of what your check says belongs to the Lord. Yes. Come on now. Uh oh. Well, okay, I'm gonna get out. Ten percent of what comes on that check belongs to the Lord. See? Okay, see, it got quiet real good right there. It got real good and quiet. I Come told y'all, y'all don't want to hear me too much. I'll tune up Thursday. <laughs> Come on. I, I need y'all to get this today because it's going to help kingdom life. The house of God really can't be built when everybody's not contributing. Oh, y'all don't believe me? The Bible says you read further down in that same text. David then, after he got all excited about giving, and he was he was exuberant about it, he was happy about his giving. And then he, he he turned around to all the people and said, "Hey, hey, who else wants to join me in blessing God for His goodness?" Come on, read it. It's in the text. He said, "Who else wants to join me in blessing God for His goodness?" And the leaders jumped on board. And said, "I'm in." I'm going to pay my, I'm going to give mine, I'm going to show my love to God. The leaders jumped in. Well, the leaders said, I'm not, you know, we're not letting our leader do it by himself. We jumping in. But then the people jumped in. Don't tell me, I'm sorry, see, this is where I get in trouble. But don't tell me you love God and you're not jumping in to solve. This text, go read it for yourself, prove that your sowing and your giving shows how much you really love God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop this in as a quick nugget, then I'm going to get out of here. Just give me five more minutes and I'll be out of your hair. Ladies and gentlemen, I need you to understand there are two ways that we can determine how much you love God. Number one, by the way you handle your body. Number two, by the way you handle your money. All right. Mama, they didn't give me a good amen. Come on. Come on. They didn't give me a good amen. I'm going to try it again. I'm going to try it one more time. Two ways we can tell how much you really love God. Number one is by how you handle your body. Number two is by how you handle your finances. Amen. Okay. Got to go. But what David did was he established a foundation of worship. That's what fathers do. We, we establish foundations of worship in our house. Number two, what fathers do is we prepare. We prepare. We prepare. We prepare. Some of us, the place of your greatest failure is that you didn't prepare. Come on, come on. Some of us are right where we are right now because we did not prepare. And according to the scriptures, we're supposed to leave an inheritance to our children and our children's children. What have you prepared? What have you prepared in your life? See, here's the problem. <clears throat> You're living for you. You're living for you. You didn't get the chance to experience your full childhood like you wanted to. So now you got your short dresses. All right. <laughs> Sister Rosalind, they don't want to talk to me. Come on, bro. You got, you got your short dresses. You going, you you in the same club with your kids. Oh, wow. Come on. Come on. Oh, oh, I know. You say, well, I don't go to those clubs. I go to the grown folks clubs. <laughs> Just because you go to the Post and the American Legion don't mean nothing. Oh, you got <laughs> but but you're living for you. you. You cannot live, ladies and gentlemen, for you. Because the day is coming when you're not going to be here. That's right. What did you leave? That's behind? right. Can't live for you. David then left another word with Solomon. He said, Solomon, as it's time for me to check out of here, he said, I need to tell you the most important thing you can ever do is serve the Lord. That's the most, that's what he said in, second, in First Kings chapter 2. He said, the most important thing you can ever do is serve the Lord. Yes, that's, right. mm. that's what real men do. Yes. We tell our children the most important thing yes. we can ever do is serve the Lord. That's right. He didn't just show it by the way he talked, yes. but by the way he walked. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, this is one of the most important texts you'll ever hear. Because he said, if you honor the Lord, God's going to honor you. God's going to favor you. As I get ready to go, this generation, I need everyone to listen very closely to this. I need everyone to hear this. We live in a generation where nobody wants to be accountable. Don't tell me what to do. Who you think you are? Yep. Come on. <clears throat> Nobody wants to be accountable. This generation, and, I, and and please understand, I'm not just talking about our young people. It's in the grown folk too. Yes, Lord. The moment we get corrected for things, we get mad. Mm -hmm. The only way you improve and get better is if someone corrects your behavior. See, I know what it is. I know what it is. You want the cheerleaders. You don't want the coaches. Wow. Wow. That's what this generation wants. We want the cheerleaders. Tell me how good I am. Tell me how wonderful I am. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, that ain't how it works. No. 
He says, if you honor God, God's going to honor you. If you walk away from God, God's going to remove that favor. There are some things that God's going to do out of his mercy. But you will miss the fullness of what God wants to do in you, through you, and for you. Because you want to do things your way. I know this is not the shout hard word, get up and dance and run. It's a good word. But this word needs to get down in all of our hearts. We need to look at ourselves and ask ourselves, what am I leaving behind? The comparison is in the book of Genesis chapter 37. Now y'all know David left a bunch of stuff behind, both good and bad. But Jacob, the Bible opens up in chapter 37, it says Jacob lived in a place where his father was a stranger.